Hello everybody, two things before we get started today. One, Japanese pronunciations. I'm not Japanese, just in case you couldn't tell, I don't speak it. I am doing my best though. Second thing is that this episode is brought to you by Curiosity Stream, a subscription streaming service that offers over 2,000 documentaries and non-fiction titles from some of the world's best filmmakers, including exclusive originals. You can get unlimited access starting at just $2.99 a month. And for our audience, the first 30 days, they're completely free. And that's just if you sign up up at curiositystream.com forward slash biographics and use the code biographics that's all lowercase no quotes during the sign up process and hey if you're looking for a specific recommendation from me on that platform then why not check out something i recently checked out it's called pioneers in aviation and look if you clicked on this video it's something you're going to be into and you can even watch it in your free trial as well as a whole lot of stuff if that doesn't sound like it's right for you or even if it does you can watch a whole bunch else as well you got 30 days it's also available on many platforms. There's a web app as well as Roku, Android, Xbox One, Smart TVs, iOS, Chromecast, Amazon Fire, Amazon Kindle, and Apple TV. It's also available worldwide. So go to curiositystream.com forward slash biographics. Unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and non-fiction series. And like I say, for our listeners, the promo code biographics gets you 30 days for free. And here's the thing. Sponsors like this, they're an amazing fit if you like this sort of content, the content that I make. So you can help support this show. You can help support me by getting that subscription. It would be awesome of you. And let's get into it. Jiro Horikoshi was the most brilliant Japanese aeronautical engineer of all time. He grew up dreaming of bringing Japan into the age where people could travel the world in airplanes. But he was born in a time when his country was at war, and the only use for his talent was to make bombers during World War II. Horikoshi designed the famous A6M-0 bomber. This was considered to be the most useful dogfighter of its time, and the plane would eventually become associated with the infamous kamikazes. On today's biographics, we look at the life story of Jiro Horikoshi's life and the impact that his creation had on the world. So before we get into the story today, we want to do something a little bit different. I want for you, for just a moment, to think about the dream that you had as a child. Now this sort of passion that we have when we're younger to be, you know, an astronaut or whatever, it kind of dies off as we get older because, you know, the powers that be want us to do one thing or there's various obstacles in our way. But for Jiro Horikoshi, the thing that always filled his childhood was airplanes. Born in 1903, Japan was slowly transitioning from living an ancient lifestyle to one of adopting modern technology that had been created in Europe. In Jiro's hometown of Fujioka, people were still traveling on dirt roads and using oxen to plow their fields. But Jiro looked up to the sky. Sometimes, if he was lucky, he could see an airplane flying overhead. Even if he couldn't touch or see it, he knew that there was a whole world out there for him to explore off the islands of Japan. The idea that a man could fly, it seemed like magic, and he wanted to become a pilot. However, he was nearsighted from a young age and began wearing glasses. He could not become a pilot because of his eyesight, but he learned that it was still possible to design planes even if he could never fly one. The only way Jerry could learn more about airplanes was to find European and American magazines on the subject. Japanese translations of these articles didn't exist, so he'd have to get a dictionary and go word by word through the articles in order to understand them. Now, this was the first generation of people in the world to experience electricity. In Japan, it was still running by candlelight. Jiro Horikoshi's mind, it was already traveling the world and it was learning to respect other cultures. At the time, one of the most respected aeronautical engineers in the world was an Italian man named Giovanni Battista Caproni. He was famous for constantly pushing the envelope on innovation and testing the limits of what was possible in airplane design. A silent film was circulated around the world showing Caproni's ridiculous attempt at trying to make a flying boat, which was a passenger plane with multiple layers of wings. Even the mere concept of a passenger plane it was incredible at the time because small aircraft could only carry one or two people. The idea that something so heavy he could fly through the air with dozens of people inside, it seemed impossible. In today's world, we truly take it for granted how easy it is for an entire family to go on holiday in a plane with hundreds of other people. Jiro Horikoshi would have seen Caproni's attempts to make magnificent planes. Caproni was truly a legend among aspiring engineers, and young Jiro began sketching his childish designs of the planes that were in his imagination.
Luckily for Jiro Arakoshi, Tokyo University opened up a brand new aviation program at their school. He traveled to a big city to join a group of young men who were just as eager to learn about engineering as he was. Finally, Jiro had a group of friends who were just as passionate about planes, and most of them would go on to become his future colleagues. In Tokyo, people were finally traveling by trains and tram cars, and the city was a blend of traditional Japanese style and European influences. For a boy who grew up in the middle of nowhere, this would have been truly spectacular. He began taking classes in calculus and physics and learned how to elevate his sketches for airplane design blueprints. For a while, things were really looking up, and he was on the path to making his dream a reality. But on September 1, 1923, Jiro was 20 years old when Tokyo was struck with the Great Kanto Earthquake. It had taken Japan years to install all of their modern innovations, but in only a few seconds, it all crumbled around them. The trains and trams were derailed from their tracks, and buildings were destroyed. The earthquake it happened at noon, so almost everyone in the city was cooking their lunch over an open flame at exactly the same time. This caused a series of firestorms like nothing we've ever seen in modern times. Thousands of people attempted to take shelter in the army clothing depot, only for them to be sitting ducks in the pathway of a fire tornado that killed 38,000 people. Since the earthquake destroyed the water mains, it took two days to put out the flames. Clouds of black smoke filled the skies of Japan, and it could be seen from miles away. The earthquake was followed by a tsunami and several aftershocks. Thousands of people were dead, and nearly two million people became homeless. And just like that, the Japanese were back to living in the Dark Ages. What followed? It was a time of great paranoia. Racist sentiments against Koreans and Chinese people led to rumors that their limited resources were being poisoned, which led to the massacre of anyone who was not Japanese. Without proper housing or healthcare, disease had also began to spread. When people are struggling to have their basic needs met, there is no room for higher education or innovation. This meant there would be no industrial revolution for Jiro and the other young engineers. During the fire, students at Tokyo University they scrambled to save their precious aeronautical engineering books from the flames. Most of the students, though, they had to bury their friends and their family. For a long time, no one was worrying about studying maths and science. It was purely just about surviving to live another day. It would take years for the city to fully recover from the natural disaster. Many of the original class either died or had to give up their dreams in order to work. Jiro was fortunate enough to have family back in Fujioka, so they didn't lose everything that they owned. When the school reopens, he was able to return to Tokyo and complete his degree. After graduating from Tokyo University, Jiro Horikoshi got his first engineering job working for Mitsubishi when he was 24 years old. Today, you might recognize the name for being a famous car manufacturer. Turns out, though, they've been around since 1870. At that time, the corporation was called Mitsubishi Internal Combustion Engine Company Limited. Their main competition was the Nakajima Aircraft Company, and the two were rivals in a fight to win contracts from the Imperial Navy. Unlike the audacious designs of Giovanni Caproni, no one in Japan was thinking about developing passive passenger planes to take people on holiday. Obviously, the Navy's main concern was making sure Imperial Japan could be just as strong, if not stronger, than their enemies. For his first assignment, Jiro Horikoshi was assigned to work on an existing team that was tasked with rebuilding the Mitsubishi 1MF9, which had been nicknamed the Falcon. It was commissioned by the Imperial Japanese Navy. A crowd of people stood to watch the Falcon take its first flight, only to witness it completely fall apart after the pilot attempted to reach its maximum speed. Engineering companies like Mitsubishi they needed government contracts in order to survive, and the higher-ups in the Imperial Japanese Navy they told all of the engineers that they needed faster planes for their ongoing conflict with China during the Second Sino-Japanese War, which overlapped with World War II. If they did not satisfy the Imperial Navy, Jiro and his friends would be out of a job, and their nation may lose the war with China. He worked day and night doing maths and sketching out designs. Most of the planes created by Japanese engineers they were copies of ones that already existed elsewhere. Creating a new plane design that had never existed before, well, it's incredibly difficult and incredibly expensive. After years of trial and error, though, Jiro finally created a blueprint of a completely innovative plane that was worthy of production 
He was 29 years old. This was the Mitsubishi 1MF10, and it went into development from 1932 to 1933. It was a monoplane, which meant that it only had one wing instead of two. However, after two failed tests, it was clear that more adjustments had to be made in his calculations. Two years later, in 1935, Jiro created the A5M, and it became the world's first carrier monoplane. It was revolutionary for the time, however, its innovation was ignored outside of Japan. In an issue of Flying and Popular Aviation magazine, one article said, Japan's military planes are so poor in comparison with other powers, they have not yet gotten beyond merely imitating what others have done. Someday, perhaps, the Japanese will have accumulated enough experience in a mechanical way to catch up, but that day will not come soon. But actually, that day came much sooner than anyone expected. By 1940, Jiro began working on the design of the next model, the A6M. It was dubbed the Model Number 00, or simply the Zero Bomber. It reached speeds of 500 km per hour, and it was equipped with two 7.7mm machine guns as well as two 20mm cannons. It could fly faster than any American plane, and it suddenly put Japan at a big technological advantage over the Allies. When the Japanese Imperial Navy saw the demonstration of the speed and agility of the Zero Bombers, they were singing high praises for Mitsubishi's work and Jiro's genius mind. In China, these Zero Bombers they were completely able to dominate their enemy's outdated biplanes. Those biplanes they were simply no match for Japan. However, none of the Mitsubishi engineers knew about the planned attack on America. We'll know what happens next. The United States finally decided to enter the conflict of World War II. Just like Icarus, the Japanese Empire flew too close to the sun and its resources were stretched too thin, but these Zero Bombers gave the Emperor a sense of newfound power. For so long, the Allies had underestimated Japan. This Zero Bomber it took everyone by surprise. In fact, even Allied intelligence operatives had ignored any information regarding the creation of Jiro's new airplanes because they simply could not believe that little old Japan was capable of developing such an advanced bomber, especially when their aeronautical industry was still so young. Mitsubishi continued to pump out more and more Zero Bombers for the Imperial Navy because they were the only thing helping them stay ahead of the Americans. For a while, the US was truly terrified of the speeds, and they couldn't keep up. Eventually, the US Navy recovered a fully intact Zero Bomber, and they were able to examine Jiro's design and isolate its weaknesses. They realized that the metal on the plane was so thin, all it took was a few shots to take out the fuel tank, and then it would explode. Even though it could reach high speeds, it became more difficult to maneuver and dodge quickly when it was going so fast. The Americans finally figured out how to take down this nearly unstoppable plane. Because of this, Japan was losing their their best pilots, and they were forced to send men who had little to no experience. Eventually, the Americans could easily take down the Zero Bombers in a matter of minutes, and there was no time to create an even better plane to replace it. The only maneuver that gave Japan any hope was the kamikaze, which was when young pilots were instructed to commit suicide by flying directly into American ships at high speed. In anti-Japanese propaganda films, they claimed these men were so brainwashed by the idolization of the emperor that they were terrorists who were willing to go on a suicide mission. These rumors they only fueled the idea that Japanese people were crazy and needed to be stopped at all costs. According to one of the kamikaze pilots who actually survived Saburo Sakai, none of those men were brainwashed and they weren't trying to kill themselves on behalf of the emperor. They were desperately trying to protect the people they loved because they felt that maybe their own death would help keep others alive. Sakai said, Even if you don't tell him to crash into something, putting a kid with only 20 hours flight time into a plane and telling him to take on US pilots is just as much a suicidal tactic as being a kamikaze. But let me tell you, all that stuff you read about dying for the emperor, that's all crap. They were thinking about their mother and their family, just like anybody else. In reality, kamikaze was never really a part of Jiro Horikoshi's plan. He had actually designed these planes to last for years so that they could be reused again and again. In fact, he even incorporated a flotation device to release on impact, which ensured that the plane would not sink after crashing into the ocean. He did everything possible to ensure the safety of the pilots. The idea was to make a plane that was so incredibly fast the enemy could not keep up and they could get in and out without putting themselves in any unnecessary danger. Just like with everything else, it was the military's decision to push men to suicide 
not Jiro's. Jiro later wrote in his diary how horrified he was by the whole situation. When we awoke on the morning of December 8, 1941, we found ourselves without any foreknowledge to be embroiled in war. Since then, the majority of us who had truly understood the awesome industrial strength of the United States never really believed that Japan would win this war. We were convinced that surely our government had in mind some diplomatic measures which would bring the conflict to a halt before the situation became catastrophic for Japan. But now, bereft of any strong government move to seek a diplomatic way out, we are being driven to doom. Japan is being destroyed. I cannot do anything other but to blame the military hierarchy and the blind politicians in power for dragging Japan into this hellish cauldron of defeat. If the war wasn't bad enough already, there was yet another natural disaster. In 1944, a major earthquake forced Mitsubishi to halt their production of Zero bombers, which put Japan at an even greater disadvantage against the Allies. Many of the buildings of the factory they were destroyed. The engineers they were relocated to a school building while the factory was repaired. Jiro Horikoshi was growing more and more depressed and anxious about the fact that his planes were causing so much destruction and that he was indirectly involved with the destruction of the Japanese Empire. He fell ill with pleurisy, and this forced him to take time off work. That same year, Tokyo and Nagoya were being bombed by the Americans. Jiro, he was too sick to evacuate. So he sent his five children, his brother-in-law, and his elderly mother to live in his family home in Gunma. Since it was in such a remote farming community, there was far less danger there. His wife stayed in Nagoya. She refused to leave his side, and she nursed him back to health. When he finally recovered and returned to work, he saw the damage that had been done to the city in his absence. He wrote, For the first time, I really feel the effects of the incendiary raids on Nagoya. The city is a wasteland, charred and unspeakably desolate. My former factory is a ghostly, steel-ribbed wreck, shattered by bombs and torn apart by the dispersal crews. It is hard to believe that all this is true. I knew that soon I would be well. Strangely, though, I had little desire to return to work. The impression of the shattered city and the wrecked factories will not leave me. After spending only a week back at work, Jiro Horikoshi realized that he truly could not take it anymore. He did not want to participate in engineering weapons of war. His wife accompanied him back to Gunma, where he lived far away from the violence. Even there, he could hear the far-off sounds of bombs being dropped on Japanese cities. In 1945, Tokyo was firebombed, and Americans killed between 80,000 and 130,000 people. The Japanese people were convinced even more than ever that a sacrifice of a few men in order to save thousands was completely necessary. A 22-year-old pilot named Kiyoshi Ogawa wrote a letter to his mother after he found out that he had been assigned a kamikaze mission. He wrote, Looking back, when I think of your raising me in your arms for more than 20 years, I am filled with a sense of gratitude. I truly believe no one else has lived a happier life than me. I am resolved to repay your kindness. I always and forever will be living near you." Together with Saizo Yasunori, they flew their Zero bombers directly into an American aircraft carrier, the USS Bunker Hill, killing and wounding hundreds of men. Even though the deaths at Pearl Harbor and USS Bunker Hill were a drop in the bucket compared to the damage that the Americans had done to Tokyo, the US continued to dehumanize Japanese people to the point where it suddenly became justifiable to drop atomic bombs on the cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945, killing an additional 129 to 226 thousand people. Mitsubishi manufactured a total of 10,400 Zero bombers, and by the end of the war, they were all destroyed. Thousands of men were killed in their prime because of the greed of a few leaders in power. Jiro Horikoshi had to live the rest of his life knowing that he was responsible for making the plane that led to so many deaths. In a different time and a different place, his mind could have been used for greater things. After Japan was occupied by the Allies, Mitsubishi was forced to disband its operations in 1947. Jiro Horikoshi he stopped designing planes and became a professor at Tokyo University in the Institute of Space and Aeronautics. Finally, he was able to teach his passion to younger men who were growing up in a time of peace. Even though they lost the war, Jiro Horikoshi proved to the world that Japanese people could invent new and innovative technology, just like the Western world. He lived to see Japan develop into the industrialized society that he had wanted for so long. In the 1970s, he finally achieved his dream of boarding a transcontinental passenger plane from Tokyo to New York City. He lived to be 78 years old and died of pneumonia in 1982.
Now that the nation was entering a time of peace, Japan could finally enter their technological renaissance. Today, when we think of places in the world that have the most advanced technological breakthroughs in science and robotics, they are one of the first places we think of. In 2013, the Oscar-winning Japanese director Hayao Miyazaki premiered an animated film about Jiro Harakoshi's life. It was called The Wind Rises. This was the last movie he made before announcing his retirement, so it became one of Japan's highest grossing films of that year. There is also a behind the scenes making of the movie documentary called The Kingdom of Dreams and Madness. Miyazaki wasn't just the artistic director, he also wrote the screenplay. While he could find all of the facts about the sequence of events of Jiro Horikoshi's life, there was little known about his relationships or his personality. Hayao Miyazaki's father, Katsui, was also an aeronautical engineer. By being born just a few years later, Katsui was spared the fate of having his designs used as weapons of war. In the moments of the movie, where Jiro's personal life was a mystery, Miyazaki filled the gaps with memories of his father. He presents the idea that when two people share the same dream, they are connected in a way that transcends time and space. No matter where, or when you were born, they can always understand one another's passion. While accepting a reward for the film on Horikoshi's life, Miyazaki said that he was incredibly privileged to have had a 50-year career during a time of peace because it meant that he had the luxury to focus on making beautiful things. In the end, one can see Jiro Horikoshi's legacy and believe that he is responsible for thousands of deaths. Or they can choose to see the young boy who had a passion for airplanes, only for the forces of evil to turn something beautiful into a vehicle of destruction. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do leave us a thumbs up below. Also subscribe. Our fantastic sponsor today was Curiosity Stream, which if you like this sort of stuff, you'll really like them. Uh, it's There's thousands of documentaries and documentary series on that platform. It's really good. Just try it for free for 30 days. There's a link below. It also helps support this channel. And as always, thank you for watching.